guys, it's June 17th, 2019, and this is your episode 152 of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as usual are Laurel Black. Hi. And Ben Charles is here. Hi, everybody. And again, guest hosting with us is Caleb Pickering. Can't get rid of me. <laughs> you're, you're back for more. <laughs> That's good. Well, you guys, our guest today is a very active performer and educator. She performs with the Concordia Foundation and works extensively with their educational program, playing an integral part in the children's productions and workshops. Laurel and I met her because she also runs literally the largest percussion retailer in the United Kingdom. So they deal instruments, sticks, mallets, sheets, sheet music, etc. You may have heard of them, especially if you're on that side of the world called Southern Percussion. They're located in Southeast England in Essex, just about an hour outside of London. And she's been a great business associate of ours and dealing our publication since, I looked it up, Katie, since 2010 was our first email correspondence that I could find. And she's just been uh, wonderful to work with and uh, totally great, great company to be with and uh, be associated with. So how's it going, Katie Elman? Thanks for the intro as well. Um, yeah, no, it's good. Nice to be on here. Thanks for the Yeah, you're very welcome. What's happening over there for you right now? I see you're in your shop. Yeah, well, it's Father's Day over here as well. So we've just literally been chilling, relaxing, having a barbecue and everything, and put the little one to bed, and now here with you guys. Um, nice relaxed day. Well, Katie, how is business? That's a really tacky question to ask, probably. No, oh, business is good. Um, we're growing all the time and, you know, just dealing with more instruments and not more products and this place is kind of getting a lot too small and next year we're doubling in size, the premises. Wow. And so it's, we're going to have, I mean, we normally have a couple of five octaves here and a couple of different rimbas and vibes for people to test and have an instrument and like swamp stuff and I, everything everywhere. And it's just there's too much stuff going on and it's time to get bigger. So it's good. That sounds very good. So spoiler alert, you're very young and you're the director of this whole company. Is that right? Um, yeah. I, um, so it's actually a 10 year anniversary um, this year. So I was, yeah, even younger. Not that young anymore. But, um, but when we, I started it and took it over from someone, it was a really small company and he was retiring and it was just one from a shed in his back garden and he kind of said to me will i take it over and at the time i didn't know what i was doing so i was like oh dad come help me and they kind of we went down in a van and kind of picked up the company and here it is it's getting it's good it's growing it's getting bigger and more staff now and yeah it's it's good and it's difficult being a female and a young female in the industry at times but um i've never really let that bother me and just i need it to my advantage let people think that i'm young and naive and they can help me and i learn so much more i use that to my advantage too <laughs> what, what what is what does being the director in, entail just in, in a few in some words um a lot of work i mean it's it, <laughs> That's probably the the first thing. I mean, now it's getting easier to, you know, you can delegate some things that it's not only not only you, but it takes some um, organisation and just it, it's deciding all the brands and how we build up the company is that by being a player myself, I only we only ever sell things here that I would play or use myself, and. If I go and I try something and I don't actually like it or I don't like the feel of that instrument or it's not that good, then I won't sell the brand or I won't sell the instruments because if people buy something from me and they're not that happy on it, then why should they trust me and come back to it again? So I've kind of used my playing and my knowledge of instruments and wanted to get further and know things and I visited all the factories that we sell and we and learn how they're all made so I can then go on and really kind of tell people what everything about it that I possibly can. Do you carry the music of Caleb Pickering? You do it, the Alan. So, sorry? The Alan publication. That's right. Oh, you do you hear that, Ooh. Caleb? You're validated. Yeah, check that out. I'll go and grab it for you and do a little like promo. It must be good then. That's great. 
Well, speaking of carrying people's music, a, a question I hear from young people a lot who are publishing, of course, we all know a lot of percussionists are self-publishing or they're just publishing and they're, they're published by companies like Cielan or Tapspace, or, uh, Roll Off, or, or pick whichever one you like. A lot of them ask, how do I get my music to be carried by a retailer like Steve Weiss Music or Southern Percussion? How, how, what advice would you, you give to those people? Um, to be really honest, if you're starting out, how we end up with music and new um, publishers and new composers is either two ways. One, someone's asking for the music, so we then have to go ourselves and kind of find it and contact the publisher, contact the composer and say, hey, we've had a request for your music, can we please order some copies and what else do you have? You know, for shipping wise, it makes more sense to bring in a couple of pieces. Or um, well, the other option is just Send a copy. Send a copy. Um, send a copy to to me that I can't. Then it's here in my shop. Don't write promo and I rip. Then I can. I go. Okay, I've got a copy here. This is the price they're wanting to sell it for. Then add it to the website. See if there's any interest. And if there's some interest out there, then we'll go. We'll sell that one copy. And then we're going to go. Okay, well I need to buy some more in because I've sold that one. More people are going to want it. So what I say is just pay the money for the postage get it on, send it out there with a letter saying the price, maybe a little description, there isn't one, a little bit about you. And that's the easiest way to do it because I don't want more music floating around the shop that's not on the system. It's far easier for me to spend the time or get someone to add it to the system and put it away. But do, do you think people will, so, so, so let's say I'm a new composer, my music isn't circulating, it's not selling, do you think just being in the in the store alone will will make it sell, or do you think that we have to do more? I mean, the greatest thing at the moment, and that you've got Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and all these things out there that you can do. And if you're if you're a player yourself, record it, get it onto Facebook, get it onto these places. Look, just do some research because then you'll know there's remember pages there's certainly on Facebook, there's so many different groups for percussion that just get there, put it in there, tag it. You know, that's the easiest thing to do is say, do a post, you go through, for instance, you see that we add it to our website, then put a video on Facebook, video on YouTube saying, hey, check out this music, and it's available from Southern Percussion. Of course, then we're going to share that on our multimedia channels, we're going to do all that because we're like, ah, oh, someone's, you know, linking through to us, someone's advertising us. And then you're going to go through and it's that kind of circle of being able to help things that you know, shops are going to help you and you help them. And it's always the way through, whether it be mallets or anything, the more you can do proactively to, to help yourself is the best thing. Because I'm not going to, if you're no one who's heard of you or no one's requesting your music, I'm not going to spend some money as a shop buying your music. Right. Right. Well, and that's why I asked, and I, of course, I already kind of knew this answer, but I wanted I wanted everyone to hear it from you because so often people think, okay, if I can just have it published or if I can just have it in the shop, it's going to, like the shop will sell it for me. And it's like, well, yes, of course, they'll facilitate selling it, but they're not going to push it for you. Yeah. We have over 20,000 different pieces of music. Uh, necessarily going to go that's the one I want. Of course, we have new we have new publications, so you're on the homepage if it's the last piece that we've added to the system to help advertise things. But at the end of the day, if someone walks in here, you're not going to know where to start with all the music and everything. They won't necessarily. Right. So recordings and videos are by far like the best way to do anything. Great to hear. Okay, Ben, I'm sorry. What do you got? No, well, oh. I, that's what I was going to get into is like, I think that especially, you know, if you're John Smith writing a marimba solo and no one's ever heard your marimba solo, then how like why is anyone going to buy it so i think it's so so important to have good quality recordings and like katie said putting you know you can put in your description available in the u.s from steve weiss music and europe from uh you know so and so um and uh oh i totally lost my train of thought with that um but yeah that's yeah that was my my main point oh laura what do you got yeah i'm curious katie so i can only imagine how many things you had to learn and figure out along the way in the 10 years and how many things you wound up learning 
because you just said, you know, you add it to the website. And I was like, man, does she add it to the website? And I can only imagine the things you've learned about like accounting and who knows, yeah. I would just love to know kind of what all you've had to figure out. I mean, it was a really difficult one when I was, I was 20 at the time that I ended up with um, some percussion. I was still at college and I didn't really know what I was doing. I was at music school my whole life and then I went on to music college. You don't have to, in England, you need like two Fs to get into music college. It doesn't matter like really how good you are at academics or not. It's, it's all just about playing and performance. So I didn't really maybe work as hard as I should have done at school. Um, so business-wise and that kind of thing, I didn't really have any idea. I was just a percussionist who was like, okay, let's go into business now and see what happens. And we took it on. I started with the sheet music, um, continued to, it was just sheet music at the beginning. And then after um, about two years of doing that, then um, I was finding out that the Mike Bolter distribution for the UK was up for grabs. So I just started kind of dabbling a little bit on mallets. And I had at the time been playing Mike Bolter mallets and I was like, okay, let's send them an email. And it'll honestly, my dad helped me with the email. My dad's a um, chartered accountant. So I was really lucky that from the word go, I had someone to kind of financially at the back of my head going like, yeah, be a little bit careful there, we'll do this. Mm. And um, wrote really formal letter to um, the people who dealt with my Bolter exports. And they sent me a message. I sent them a message about 10 o'clock at night. They responded at 11 o'clock that night, saying, okay, we'll see you, but we'll see you at nine o'clock tomorrow morning in London. And I was like, okay, um, what do I do? What do I say? Like, I'm kind of not really prepared for anything. I've just sent a really formal business email that wasn't even me. So I kind of went there and, um, and they'll, they'll say this story. They love, they love kind of when they, we talk about this back now, how things have changed, but, I kind of went there and went, okay, well, I know these six, let's talk about the six, what I like, what I don't like, what I think sell more, what things could happen. And I was just honest and I said, okay, I, I don't know numbers, but they of course don't talk numbers with you at the beginning. And then kind of a couple of days later, I won the Mike Bolter distribution for the UK and was like, okay, well, maybe I can actually do this by knowing what I know and then building it up from there. You know, you have the differences that next came Marimba one and I flew over to America. And in that situation, I was in a boardroom, a big boardroom with a massive table in front of me and them on one side and me on the other. And they were like, right, let's talk numbers. Let's do this. And I was like, had a calculator there and I was like, okay. And it was just being thrown in the deep end actually just made, it was kind of, I was either going to sink or I was going to swim. And luckily I've always been one of those things that I can't not succeed. I have to just, no matter what, I'm going to go for it and put everything I can like into it. And thankfully, I think well, so far it's working out. I hope it continues. But as far as it goes with the website and everything, until I think two years ago, absolutely everything was just me. So I did this whole entire company on my own. So when you can read oh the, the new thing on like I'm not very good at Facebook, still not very good at Facebook and all those kind of bits. But kind of product added to the website, images on the website, pictures. It was all me. Everything. And that's what you kind of I was working till two o'clock at night. I was still performing. Until five years ago I was gigging four nights a week as well on a tour. So I kind of had I don't know how I did it all. I think there was a lot of caffeine involved, but um, yeah, just play for it. Well, it seems like you always hear about the little time period with a a anyone successful where they had this this window of years that was just totally freaking insane, like wall to wall busy, and they they get through it, and there's sunshine on the other end. And yeah, what do you got, Caleb? Yeah, I think it's just really cool. This is another person that's come up that they might not have had the traditional training for what they went into, like Casey with you and your video editing. And it's just kind of cool to get right. in and see, it's just people like getting there. They didn't like have all these special like 
years of MBAs or whatever. It was just figuring it out as you go and just like learning the skill set. I just think it's really cool to yeah to see yet again another. Yeah, you're, you're, you're exactly right, and we see those people over and over and over. And yeah, Katie's another one. Yeah, I was just gonna say, like Caleb mentioned, video editing. I think it's it's so true that every single time you edit video or do a business transaction or anything like that like you learn so many new skills and you just they just go in your back pocket and you can use them the next time i just think about the most two recent videos that i edited and there were skills on the first video that i figured out that i didn't even know i would need on the second video but then yeah that was very applicable and i'm sure the same is going with business deals i can't imagine flying to america to meet with marimba one for business having never really done all that much business <laughs> but after having ron on the podcast i can kind of imagine yeah. it's like oh dude this guy like like katie said the boardroom and i imagined oh yeah what there's like a bunch of marimba bars everywhere a bunch of boards what um, it's probably really laid back no you know what yes oh i remember after that day yeah completely and i remember when i when i feel that we actually had like a really big earthquake at the time as well that was like the most terrible so i kind of had like a couple of first and that kind of that trip was absolutely crazy and we'll never forget but it was that first day i think i i didn't think that we kind of came off the plane and then near enough straight into this and they kind of just drilled me for like a day and then we're like yeah cool now on to the rest of it you know and then it all the fun began so i think maybe a little bit of a you know fun and games to see whether i kind of could hold my ground or not, but um, Ron can um, he can do business like if you um, if you need be. <laughs> I I missed that. Say it one more time. Ron is. Ron can be business like if he needs to be. Oh right, gotcha, gotcha. Of course. Is well, that? then I'm a little insulted because this podcast is all business, and he was way laid back. <laughs> it's totally business. What you got, Ben? Uh, so I had a question. We're talking about all this like trial by fire sort of stuff, and obviously that's that's the main way you learn this. But and it sounds like you had your father was sort of in business to a certain extent, so you got some advice from him. Were there any books that you read? <laughs> I'm not kind of I'm not much maybe not much as a of a reader. Um, I still even now, well, rightly or wrongly, don't really do the whole like business. Um, would never think about going through a business course or a business degree i mean i did i think i remember did one i think uktr like on a government scheme to do with um i think a business or something about expanding a company and going into different territories but other than that no i just if something goes horribly wrong then i'll fix it and just keep going and trying and don't think so far anything's gone hugely wrong so i'm just lucky Cool, cool. Well, you're already doing it, so it seems like you don't need to go to the schools or anything. <laughs> I'm sure I'll mess up big time at some point, too. <laughs> well, guys, let's give Katie just a little break. You know, and I, I thought of this because Ben mentioned video editing, and I have put a little sound together for you guys. So this has nothing to do with Southern Percussion or Katie, but Is it's a... Cocktails theme? Oh, that was that was fun. That was that was some hard work I had to do, but this one is uh, a sound that you might hear, and this is going to be just too easy for you guys. You guys are going to get this. This is a sound that, that we get back, yeah, in Australia. So here you go. All right, any idea? I didn't really get Caleb it. Caleb did Caleb this. did a little gesture, and I think I know what it is. Caleb, why don't you say it? I was just practicing my lasso from oh. Texas. But, uh, <laughs> is it bull Ah, uh, Laurel, we got him. Laurel, do you want to tell him what it really is? I, was, I wasn't going to. It's him a what weed it eater. Yeah, it's a weed whacker. Weed whacker? Yeah, so no, I knew you would get this, so I did some editing, and I took the sound of a weed whacker and tried to mimic the sound of a bull roar. But you're absolutely right, the real thing is bull roar, and here's a real bull roar for you, instead of a weed whacker. <laughs> That's good, so now you're laughing. Here's the weed eater one more time.
in your defense, I did manipulate it to sound like a bull roar. It's, it uh, was took way too much time. But yeah, through uh, clever audio editing, I did mess with the pitch and the volumes and uh, tr try to make it sound like that a little bit. And by too much time, he means like three or four hours. It didn't take that long. It did take it did take too long. I mean, 30 minutes is too long, but it, it did. Yeah. It was several hours. <laughs> I don't know if it was several hours. Yes. Did you sample your own weed whacker? <laughs> no, so I downloaded from YouTube. I, 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 well, I sampled from this video two hours of weed whacker sound. Something What's you can, that YouTube? I don't know. There's a lot of that on YouTube. A lot of weird, just like two hours of airplane ambient sound, two hours of weed whacker. So anyway, I, I use what's called elastic pitch modifier. And so brought all the levels of the sound down. And I even took screenshots for you. So what you're looking at is something, a, a little plug-in in Samplitude called Elastic Audio Editor. And the orange line is pitch. So you guys know it's real easy to adjust pitch of a wave sound. But this is great because it lets you draw the, the, the pitch level wherever you want it to be. And so I just kind of made a zigzag up and down to make it sound like a weed eater. Because the problem is a weed eater is just like, the sound is just straight, the pitch is too consistent. Whereas a bull roar, the pitch goes up and down and the volume goes in and out. So let me just tell you guys what a bull roar is exactly for those of you who don't know. So commonly known as a bull roar, but can also be called a turndun, a rombi or a rombus dates back to 17 or 18,000 BC in Ukraine, depending on what you read. I saw, I saw both numbers. So it's a little rectangular usually kind of arrow shaped piece of wood or stone or bone usually wood though it's about six inches all the way up to two feet long and about two or so inches wide and like I said it's like a blade or propeller that's attached to uh, a, a thin piece of rope and it's swung either over your head or at your side and of course what's happening is the the blade spins so rapidly through the air that it flips around wildly and makes this really unique and uh, makes this unique, cool sound. We think of them as Australian. Do you guys know why we are always Australia comes to mind when we think of this instrument? No. Do you know who Paul Hogan is? I have a feeling Caleb does. Is that like Hogan's Heroes, Paul Hogan? <laughs> Paul Hogan from like, that's a knife. Well, that's, that's it, yeah, that's Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so anyway, we, Crocodile Dundee was like huge when I was a kid, and I loved Crocodile Dundee, and that was probably the first time I ever saw this instrument or heard this instrument. I imagine a lot of other people uh, the same. So, of course, we think, yeah, okay, this is an authentic Australian Aborigine instrument, but actually it's found a lot more places. So a lot of cultures have this uh, instrument or some variation of the bull roar, the Maori culture in New Zealand. Bull roars are made from wood, stone, or bone and are used for healing or making rain. The Dogon people of Mali in South Africa use bull roars as ancestral voices and for ceremonies. In the Americas, both South, North, cultures all the way from Amazon up to the Inuits in the far, far North have their variations of bull roars. They're in ancient Greece. The bull roar was called the rhombus, which literally means whirling or rumbling, of course, this is named after that sound, but also its close resemblance to the rhombus, which is the triangle in, in geometry, the, the diamond shape in Euclidean geometry. Bull roars were used in the cult of the Greek god Cybele. You see them in Britain and Ireland as well, ceremonies and also toys. Parts of Scotland refer to them as the thunder spell, and you'll actually see it as something called a thunder I think it's a thunder stick in in this book, which is Contemporary Percussion by Reginald Brindle. And that's pretty useful because there is a Henry Cowell piece that calls for two bull roars, and I guess he calls them thunder sticks in it, and that must come from Scotland, where they call them uh, no, known as the thunder spell. In Scandinavia, dating back to the Stone Age, bull roar is called broomer in Scandinavia, and of course, Aboriginal culture 
culture and it has all sorts of meanings and has a lot to do with male versus female ceremonies and uh, um, spells and symbolism. Bull roars were considered secret men's business by some aboriginal tribal groups and hence forbidden for women, children, non-initiated men, and outsiders to even hear. Some further reading, there's some great references listed on Wikipedia and the most comprehensive article I found online that was at least free was something called Tribal Initiations and Secret Societies by Edwin Loeb, University of California Publications, all the way back in 1929. So I mentioned Henry Cowell. He's got a piece for two violins, viola, two cellos, and two bull roars, but he calls them thunder sticks. And also someone named John Antill, his ballet called Corroboree. So that's not George Antill, but John Antill, which I guess is he's a famous Australian composer. And this piece is really cool. It's a 40 or so minute ballet. And man, if you, like probably everyone, you like the Rite of Spring and you just wish it was, say, 40 minutes longer, you totally need to listen to this piece because it is so close to um, Stravinsky. And I've got just a little taste of it for you here. I found where the bull roars are played. So those are a few uses in music of bull roars. Do you guys know of any others? Caleb, I know Dean Gronemeyer has a piece that uses one. Is that right? Uh, he does. I think it's just added in at the end. I do remember, I can't remember what it was. I do remember seeing uh, Brian Zader, Chris Dean, and John Lane do a piece. Ben probably knows what it is. All I remember is that Chris Dean's bull roar broke and like flew across the concert hall and we just had to <laughs> stifle laughter for like the next three minutes until we all got I, through it. I don't remember the, like what piece that was, but I can like, I can picture it. And I've seen people do it both above their head and like in front of them, like vertically. But I just, I just had a couple of things to add. Um, one is just percussion terminology. Do not get bull roarer confused with lion's roar which is a totally different instrument. A lion's roar is basically like a jumbo sized cuica, uh, and you use this in third construction. Uh, John Cage used it, I think, in several works, and you see it some other places. But so basically you have like, a, like imagine like a, maybe a marching bass drum size with a either a string or a dowel through the head, and you play it by putting rosin on that and dragging like a wet cloth across, and it gets sort of, it sounds sort of like a, I don't know, like a lion's roar or something. <laughs> Um, but yeah, two totally different instruments. But I was going to bring up, um, so I, when I was a graduate student at Illinois, I played a, a small chamber piece, and uh, my setup had chimes in it, and I also had to play bull roar, which if you can think about the mechanics of standing next to a set of vertical chimes trying to spin a bull roar around your head, it does not work very well. Um, but Bill Mersch gave me uh, a very exotic bull roar replacement, and I just Googled to try and find the name of it, and I found it's either, I, it seems like the same instrument, just different names, buzzing bow or wind wand. And there is actually oh, cool. a double wind wand. Um, but basically it's like a lightweight wooden frame. Um, and it's like, I imagine almost like a big ratchet, like that it'll spin around like that. And you attach like a, a one of those like huge, like jumbo rubber bands to it. Rubber and bands, yeah. Thin. And I think that if you ever have to play a bull roar, that's, I mean, it's not quote unquote authentic, but it's a lot easier to control. You get a much more constant sound and you don't risk the Christopher Dean's bore flying off. <laughs> Killing um, somebody, yeah. Described. But yeah, um, like I said, I played that one piece that had bore and that's my, that's my only bull roaring experience so far. <laughs> There, there is one, I saw a YouTube video of one like you're describing. It's short, it has these rubber bands. I think they called it like a double, double bull roar or double wind wand or yeah, something. Yeah, I, just, I found and a it, double wind wand online, yeah. 
and it, and it does seem really really easy to play it doesn't quite sound the same to me yeah it but... seems like it, it's more of a constant hum whereas a bull roar i guess because it's traveling so far it has more of like a doppler effect to it doppler effect yeah yeah I, I was gonna say you said don't confuse it for a lion's roar and also don't confuse it for a boron <laughs> the, like the drum from ireland yeah because yeah, they're yeah sound very much the same as if far you, as the if you're confused expert. about these and need to order any of them contact southern percussion <laughs> <laughs> right katie carries all this stuff she'll answer all your questions about all of they're this. actually they're getting the they're doubling their space just for their bull roar inventory <laughs> Yeah, you know, people are going to start this now, aren't they? I'm going to get how many emails going, oh, so where can I get one from? And we'll be like, oh, crap, I need to start looking up some things. Well, the problem is some someone will say bull roar, someone will say buzzing stick, someone will say thunder stick. It's, Somebody it's told me or the lion's roar would be very upset when the wrong thing arrives. We better just bag this. I better just bag this segment. <laughs> it's yeah. a nightmare. So have you guys had to play Bull Roar before? I found it to be, I've only played it a couple of times, but I find them to be either challenging and taking a lot of strength or just very easy. Yeah, mostly just annoying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going. After you get it going, it's not a big deal, but like the first couple of swings are always the to get it turning a little bit. Right, yeah, to get it. Like when you have to play wine glasses, is another one like, God, I hope this works. <laughs> Right, to to get it spinning. But I find like once it is spinning, man, I, it's a workout. Like there's so much air resistance to get that sound really happening. We use rulers, like the plastic see-through rulers. And that, that works? Them. Yeah, it works fine. Oh, cool. It's harder to get started, but it's way easier because, I mean, it weighs nothing. Yeah, it's way light. I bet the pitch is pretty steady and, and high-pitched, right? I can't remember. It's been too long. So, Katie, uh, all jokes aside, speaking of unusual instruments, obviously as a percussion retailer, you want to carry standard sticks, mallets, drums, that sort of thing that you know you're going to sell. But do you stock any, like, unusual instruments that you, like, that are, like, ordered more often than you might think or anything like that? Is there any peculiar, th peculiar things that come up in inventory? Or what are some of the more peculiar requests that you've had to research? Oh, God. Um... Yeah, there's some, we try and keep like, um, a mixture of everything, so mallet-wise and some of the unusual mallets. Generally, if we're a distributor or retailer of some of them, I try to keep everything in, so you do get some weird ones with them. I mean, one of the strangest ones is, that we sell quite a few of, is, what's it called? It's the, it, from my own, it's the cricket sound effect. Yeah. But we sell so many of those things, and you're like, okay, how many people are going to need this sound and are needing for it? And you always kind of have to wonder what it is that they're doing with them and for what effect they're doing. So that's kind of probably on a day-to-day -day basis one of the strangest ones, I have to say, that I don't really get why somebody go out. So that, that reminds me, here a few weeks ago, I was, or I guess a few months ago at this point, I was walking by our like the business office in our Fine Arts Center and our business manager was like, oh, I have a package in for you. I was like, okay, I didn't order anything. And it was a box from Majestic, like Majestic Percussion. I was like, this is this is unusual, I don't think. And it was from uh, Lone Star Percussion. I was like, yeah. I don't think I ordered anything from Majestic. And I was like, maybe maybe Casey had them send me something. Uh, and I opened it up. Yeah, yeah right. It was, it was a set of Majestic dinner chimes. And I was yeah. like, what on earth? Like, I like maybe the wind ensemble needs these or something, and they, they didn't, no one knew what it was. And so we finally, we checked what credit card had ordered it, and it was for our, uh, we have an ROTC program, like a military program here, and they use it for some function, and they had ordered it, but like, it was weird because when I think Majestic, I don't think of like, quirky little sort of, I don't know, no. like dinner chimes. <laughs> it's not something that, that I would think of the Marimba company making. Um, so yeah, just a little recent experience I had with that. You'd be surprised to think some of the companies that you get like random little things from some of the companies and you do wonder what, why it's come from that. A lot of things make sense, but yeah, you'd be surprised, you'd be surprised how many there's like little quirky things that go with companies. Well, the marimbas are pretty new for Majestic. They've been making timpani and drums and tom-toms for, for, for much longer, for sure. Yeah, the marimba is... Yeah, not not too many years in yet. So I've got a little summary and 
kind of just a personal share about one of my favorite books that I learned about from my old teacher, Tim Jones, who is an Australian, but he learned, a, I guess it's not video, but it's called Performing in the Zone uh, by John Gorey. Uh, that's G-O-R-R-I-E, if you ever want to look it up. Uh, he's in Norway now. He's a trumpet player. He's actually New Zealand born. But uh, he wrote this a few years after he wrote a pretty prolific article on focal dystonia and recovery, because he had that with his embouchure. Um, I don't know all what that involves. I just know it really injures your uh, ability to use your muscles like that. But he wrote this book, Performing in the Zone, which basically covers what we uh, label as performance anxiety. Uh, I'll just go ahead and say it now so Ben gets all his jokes out of the way. He uses the term performance arousal. So I'm going to be using the word arousal a lot. So if everyone can just keep a happy face on, that'll be fine. We're going to be real mature about this. That's, from history, I figure that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Nobody look at the chat. It's covered. So uh, it's published in 2009. But what's really cool is it aims just for a uh, public performance in general. So that could be musician, actor, anyone that just does public speaking. Uh, dancers, uh, as far as people that are maybe ahead of a company. Oh, Katie, I mean, uh, even athletes. So it's called Performing in the Zone. And basically this concept is kind of intangible. The concept of the zone, as he calls it, is uh, it's also referred to as flow by some people or being centered in some philosophies. Uh, there's a thousand different names for it, but it's all kind of the same idea. So for him, uh, the zone is this ideal place, the state of mind we're performing, he says, is easy and comfortable, where your actions are efficient and effortless, and when your results are up to or even exceed your previous expectations. And he even brings up that a lot of us probably have felt this with, um, say, a solo piece that you know really well, maybe something you've been playing for years and years and years, and you know all the notes, and maybe some of them have changed, or maybe you have like a deep connection to it. Just something you've performed a lot that you can pull out any day of the year, and you're good to go. So it's a book basically on performance psychology, and the premise is around uh, this idea of performance arousal, which is basically taking that nervous energy, that performance energy, and framing it in a more positive connotation. So if you have anxiety, that's negative. If you have this performance energy, performance arousal, that's the positive. So what he does is he kind of gives you a one to five, sorry, a five to five scale. So if you think if we're sitting at zero on a number scale, that's just where we are right now. So maybe we're all calm, rested, we're not really high stress, high pressure. It goes all the way up to positive five. So positive one, two, three, four, five. Five is like peak excitement. So like um, a professional athlete, like a professional football player, but hopefully when they're about to go play, they're at that positive five, like as much hype as they can get. And then all the way down to negative five, which is like debilitating panic attack. So uh, he says uh, negative five, a good example is say you fall into a cage at the zoo and you realize you're about to be eaten by lion, tiger, oh my. Um, that's like negative five. You can't get any more panic than that. Uh, so it's really interesting. What he does is basically he gives you all these techniques that channel this performance energy into the correct amount of performance arousal. So someone that's perfectly rested, so maybe right now all four of you are at zero, but since I'm the one talking, maybe I'm at plus one right. uh, performance arousal. So right now, if I were at plus, say, plus four on this performance arousal chart, I would probably be stuttering a lot, like tripping over my words, like sweating, you know, all the anxiety stuff. Uh, too much, I guess that would actually sorry, be negative four. Positive four was if I thought this was like the most groundbreaking thing that has ever been birthed into mankind, um, something like that. So he says public speaking, maybe plus two or three, uh, maybe a modern dancer, someone in ballet might want positive four because it's more physical. So basically, he gives you this idea to visualize uh, where your performance arousal and anxieties, energies are. And the idea is every time you practice, perform, anything like that, you journal it. 
And so you have this data, these plus negative five to positive five data points you can look back over uh, and just see what's going on in your head, basically. So that's kind of the first part of the book is he just explains the system. And then the best part, honestly, is the next, which is 26 techniques he provides. So he basically gives 26, te 26 techniques, tongue twister, to basically either calm yourself down, some of them kind of psych you up. But basically, it's this whole idea of giving your head something to do. So normally when you get nervous, you get anxious, it's because you have that inner monologue that's distracting you and pulling your attention elsewhere. So these are all 26 different techniques some of them that are done like in the moment, like mid-performance, and some that are preparatory, some that you do after, but they're all aimed to get rid of that inner monologue that's uh, distracting and negative. So what I like about these techniques is uh, they are far more in-depth than your classic 26 BuzzFeed article of 20, <laughs> 26 ways to whatever. It's better than BuzzFeed. Yeah, it's better than BuzzFeed. Um, but it goes from simple breathing exercises like the, uh, you know, inhale for this many counts, hold it, exhale for that many counts, do it again. Uh, so it goes all the way to talking about how to adjust your speaking voice just in your day to day to find the most centered pitch reference for yourself. So that before performance, you have that pitch and that timbre internalized and you just read out loud and you bring it back down to your calm, steady talking uh, and then it gets as in-depth as some, uh, personally, my favorite one, I think, is called Going Peripheral. And it's talking about your peripheral vision. But basically, he says, uh, and you see it in nature documentaries or nervous performers, you'll, they'll get that tunnel vision where they don't look left or right. They're just, you're basically, you're centered on what you think is the threat. This at hand, so animals, if you're about to get eaten, you're probably not going to be looking at the butterflies and the trees floating around, probably just focused on whatever's eating you. But it goes as far as to, he brings up this tunnel vision that's immediately in front of you. And if you ever feel like coming on, he gives you ways. One of them is to just simply look to the left or the right. And that basically tells your mind that, okay, whatever in front of the, whatever is in front of him or her is not a threat because they've broken their tunnel vision. Hmm. So just by doing these simple things, your body kind of, resets itself, uh, your parasympathetic nervous system, it's a fancy word, uh, basically it sl uh, stops, it slows down, so it kind of brings you back to calm and centered. Uh, but it's really, I think it's a really great book. Tim Jones at UNLV Las Vegas, uh, the year before I got here, he had the whole percussion studio. Uh, at the end of this is a 12-week program. You go week by week. And they had all, I think, 20, 25 students do it. And it was all positive results. Like everyone saw pros in it. And there's a great percussive article. Uh, I'm not sure what month or what year it is in. Uh, it is in. You could very easily Google it. Um, but it's really cool because it also pairs nicely with, I'm sure you've all heard of The Inner Game of Tennis. Right. Tim Galley's book. It actually pairs really well with his second book, uh, I think it's the second, it's The Inner Game of Golf. Oh, right. Actually, golf is way hard to find, but The Inner Game of Golf is better than The Inner Game of Tennis. Okay. Yeah, so it's really nice because in The Inner Game of Tennis, he comes up with these ideas, and Inner Game of Golf, he's learning a new skill set, so some of the ideas he's come up with have changed as he's done on himself. Uh, just another little book. But it's really cool because he gives... Uh, John Gorey performing in the zone basically gives you a series of 26 techniques and a 12 week system that addresses diet, exercise, sleep habits, positive thinking, these 26 techniques, practice techniques, neuro linguistic programming. It just runs the whole gamut. Um, but it's a really great book. I've recommended it to so many people, and no one has ever said that it didn't help. Because even, I mean, out of 26 techniques, even if you find one, that you can do mid-performance or backstage, surely one of these is gonna, you know, it's gonna work for you. And really, I think it's, I think it's one. It's not very expensive. I think it's like twenty bucks. It's paperback. You can get it used. And for the knowledge that's in it, it's only about two hundred pages, and a lot of them are charts and graphs and stuff. So to really read it, you could probably read it in a weekend or a week, uh, weeknights. 
Are there a lot of pictures in there? I need pictures. Yeah, there's this one. Look at that. Is that a picture? It's got like a body mass index. Over. Uh, no, that's a graph. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Can't do that. Uh, oh, here's a picture of this person doing yoga. That's good. There we go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyways, that's that's about all I could say for this one. But That's great. For anyone, especially that has any sort of performance anxiety or feels pressure uh, at performance, be that music or speaking, classroom speaking, anything like that, I think this is a great book because it just has, I mean, just so many different ways you can help yourself. You know, why not pick it up? That's great, Caleb. Thanks a lot. There are so many of these books. We talked about Peak a few episodes ago. There's Inner Game of Tennis, Inner Game of Golf. Uh, people talk about the the War of Art, and just, there's just so so many. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's um, yeah. What do you got, Laurel? Yeah, I was just gonna say that I I had never heard of the technique of using your speaking voice to calm you down. That's new to me, so I will try that. And I was curious to know about um, you guys, if you've experienced this or not, but as I get older, I get more anxious about performance. And I'm not, it's not debilitating at all, but I'm just much more aware of it now that I'm older. I feel like when I was younger, I was just like, hell yeah, I'm just gonna do my best and that's it. And have you guys felt the same thing? Well, I definitely relate to what Caleb, the, the book says about like anxiety, like, like feeling good and nervous are very close. And I know I've tried mm -hmm. to describe that before. Like you can really channel your nervousness into positive performance energy. Like I feel like fear and excitement are, they're like, I don't know, they're very closely related. I feel like over yeah. the years I have trained myself to just feel it in the good way and I to answer your question, Laurel, it's gotten better for me. I don't know if it's only gotten better. It hasn't gotten like exponentially better. It's kind of plateaued, but overall, yeah, it feels, it feels fine. And, um, yeah. And of course my, my advice to students is always, well, you just got to perform more. You got to get more, more comfortable in front of audience and you got to practice doing it in front of people as much as you possibly can. But it's, it's great to know that, there's something they can do away from that too. You know, they can like, yeah, dude, read, read this book, <laughs> read any number of one of these books and start to really address and tackle this problem. Yeah. I think that for me, it sort of did it, you know, did it with Casey here. I've, uh, when I was younger, especially I had a lot of performance anxiety and over the years I've managed to turn that energy into a positive thing. And it, it makes me think of two thoughts. One, I remember I had a lesson with Matt Strauss, and he said, he was like, pardon the double negative, but you're never going to not get nervous. You're always going to get nervous, so you have to figure out how to turn that nervous energy into something good. And then the other one, just a sort of amusing thought, I saw Leonard Slatkin do a, like a conducting workshop, and uh, he asked the players or the people in the audience, you know, do you, do you get nervous when you go on stage? And of course, most people are, you know, not afraid to admit, yeah, like, you know, it's nerve wracking to go on stage. And he said, why? And someone, you know, he asked one person in particular and they said, well, you know, because I might screw up. And he said, well, like, haven't you practiced? What are, like, if you've practiced, you're not going to screw up, right? And it's like, well, yeah, you're Leonard Slatkin, so it's easy for you to say that, I think. But for... I think most of us, yeah, there is that sort of nervous energy that we just have to learn to channel into something positive. Yeah, for sure. I was wondering, does anybody, I find not a lot of people have this one, but does anybody have more anxiety uh, after? Like after your performance? No, but I've heard of that. This, this for me, for sure. Like beforehand, I'm not nervous at all. But like performance is over, it's done. It's just, yeah, that's when it gets me. I don't know. I think it's just because it's like reflecting back on everything. And this, that's like what causes my uh, anxiousness overall. I guess it depends how good you played or not. Yeah. How you feel. <laughs> say, say that again, Katie. I missed it. So I guess it depends how good or bad you played. Oh, right. Yeah, of course. But Caleb, do you feel, do you feel that way even after playing well? Yeah, normally. Yeah, is it because it, I know I don't really enjoy so much the chat after, you know, you go out and you shake hands and you, I don't know why I don't. Um, and, you know, usually you're getting praise, like people are telling you nice things and you're getting compliments. But there's, yeah, I don't know. There's something about that that I'd rather just, you know, 
let's all sit down and have a, have a drink and hang out and, and talk. You know what I mean? I, I guess it, 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 yeah, small talk is kind of difficult and small talk about a performance is, is, is even harder. You know what I mean? Um, but it doesn't make me nervous. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that the opposite. I find that once you've done all the small talk with some of the people afterwards, it kind of gives me a chance just to, to breathe a little bit. And then after that, done and the instruments all packed away and, and you're doing solo things but then you I sit down with the pianist and, left and we just talk through the whole entire concert and then you but I think if you hadn't had that space beforehand where you do some of the small talk and you meet the audience it kind of gives you that sense of you know even if things haven't gone so well as you planned it gives you that time to just down and and know that other people enjoy it so I think you're always going to be too picky and too harsh on yourself if you go straight from a concert to then discussing it and analysing it afterwards. I think you've got to remember that I think unless you're in a really unique situation, there will always be parts of a concert. If you're doing a full concert, there's always going to be bits of it that you're going to go, oh, I wish I'd played that bit better or not. And you've got to learn to, as much as you're only as good as your last performance, you've also got to remember that people don't necessarily expect it to be 100% perfect. And it's nice to hear that the people in the audience enjoyed it. Yeah, of course. It, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I, I don't want to sound like, man, I'm, I'm ungrateful for, for compliments or the small talk because it, it should be a nice thing. And I guess it is a nice thing. I guess it's just there's that you, you have that really thin layer. When you meet someone new, you have to get through that thin layer of surface level conversation until you feel comfortable. And I guess I just want to get to that comfortable place. You know, and I and, and you know, we, we all do art and we all do music because we're trying to elevate our, our thinking. And like they say, you know, it's uh, art is supposed to teach us more about ourselves as humans, yada, 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 all that great stuff. And you can never do that at the surface level conversation. It's only like, you know, in fact, I could I give you an example. Last week I was with Morris Palter and Bill Kahn, which you guys heard back on episode 100 and I think it was 149. And man, like it was just so great to, to peel away those layers with, with Bill Kahn, you know, we've had Bill Kahn on the podcast before, but seeing him one-on-one -on -one and going on a hike together and, and you just, yeah, you get, getting past all that small talk is just great. And I guess I just, yeah, I, I never look forward to like, oh, dang it, we're not, we're not going to get through these layers. And I wish we would, because you can't, you don't have time. It's not practical. These people want to say, hey, nice job, enjoyed your concert. And they want to say stuff like, what was that thing you hit? That thing? Oh, yeah, it was a bull roar. OK, and, you, you know, and it's like, oh, man, I just want to get to the I just want to get to the good stuff. I want to get elevated. You know, I want us to elevate each other in our, our thinking. So something I wanted to ask Katie, I, I wonder if you've seen with your work any trends with sheet music sale. I know a few weeks ago I reported on a piece that actually Southern Percussion carries and it's this little snare drum solo by Richard E. Rogers Jr. called Flamboyant and I reported on it because it's something that I don't see people playing anymore. Maybe they're playing it over there more but it was something I was assigned as a student so it's not too long ago and it's just amazing to me that it made it all the way over from the East Coast, the U.S. to the West Coast, where I grew up in Utah. And my teacher assigned it to me. I played it. It was a known piece. And yet it's kind of fallen into obscurity. I don't see a single YouTube recording. None of my students had heard of it. I ask around. People haven't heard of it. It's like, man, how can this piece of music that was so known now be so forgotten. And I just wonder if you see things like trends and sales or ups and downs and have any insight to why that might be. Yeah, there's always, it always seems to be the way that there's sudden ones on um, piece of music. I mean, the last one in the last week has been Eric Sumber on the doll, which is, you know, you go through and you all of a sudden sell 30 copies of something in the space of a day or two days. And then you'll get nothing for months to come. And I think that quite often it will depend if there's a competition has been announced or, I mean, over with you guys, I think that we have state competitions and different things like that that roll off kind of carry with ensemble music and different things. So you, um, you get ones like that, but also, yeah, I mean, also the, the other option is that someone's done a post on Facebook or something and done a recording. It's amazing how 
um, that can trend it up as well. So, and then it gets shared loads of times, and then um, everyone who sh shared it then wants to view it again and wants to then buy the music. And, and that's why it always helps when you've got links and stuff when you're going to do a video thing and to kind of say where things get from. If certainly you're the composer, that's always a, it's always a nice thing to do. And it also works. Yeah. Well, you guys, thanks so much. This was really great. And Katie Elman, thanks so much for joining us. And just congratulations with everything you're doing with Southern Percussion. You guys are just totally doing great. Thank you for having me as well. Yeah, you're very welcome. Well, Laurel, Ben, Caleb, thanks a bunch. And we'll catch you guys on uh, 153.